Guys, that was awesome. Well, it is an honor uh, for those that I have met. Uh, my wife and I, Jess, have been in Yakima since uh, last July, last June, and part of this church, church since last November. And so it's a real honor just to get to share and be part of this night. And uh, Dan and I have been kind of praying about it, and Janine and Jess for, for a while of just what it could look like. And I'm just, uh, I'm just excited to hear what, what God's going to do. I'm here because I need a fresh encounter of him. I don't know about you, but I want a fresh encounter. Sign me up first, and then everyone else can follow. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I want God to encounter me. I want to know him more, and uh, that's my heart for tonight. And a uh, little bit, uh, I'll share maybe tomorrow, but again, we're moving, we're here for two years from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, Jess is doing a pediatric dentist program, dentistry program, and uh, it's just an honor to be here. And just, you know, as we were coming here, and as I, I lead a ministry back in Canada and I travel back and forth, I just sense that God has us here for a reason and we just want to be a part of whatever God's doing and he's doing some incredible stuff and I just sense that this weekend for this church is a, is a step this is a step forward. Whatever, whatever is, uh, whatever there be a cloud or or a canopy to wherever ceiling we're at, there's another level. He's like taking the ceiling away and he's saying there's more. And I just, I'm excited to be a part of it. And um, we, I get to travel to different places. Last weekend, I was in Calgary, Alberta, and uh, just under 40 kids said yes to Jesus for the first time. And, um, and at the end of the day, it's about the gospel, isn't it? It's about people knowing Jesus. And, uh, and, and then we're off next week to Amsterdam to the largest evangelist conference in the world. God is doing something globally. There is something happening that God is doing. And it's just an honor to be a part of it. And so the thought I have for you tonight, I want to talk to you, is about encounter. The word of my heart is encounter. And it's up on the screen. But um, a few weekends ago, we had a weekend off. And those that kind of know me, uh, I have been here and there because uh, I've been back to Canada and Jess is here. And then we're gone somewhere because of an opportunity. And so it's been a lot of travel. And so we had one weekend off. And uh, some of our co-residents said, okay, we're going to go to Anna Cortes. Cortes. I asked Renee how to say it. And she told me, and then I messed it up. I said Cortez. It's not Cortez, it's Cortez. Anna Cortez, right? Kind of? Okay. Um, so we went to look at tulips. So we had the weekend off. I, there's a lot of tulips. There's so many colors of tulips. And we're there, we're seeing tulips. And then one of Jess's uh, co-residents said, hey, we're going to go whale watching. And I'm like, whale watching? Like, I've been whale watching before. You get on a boat, you don't see anything, you come back. You know, that's, that's kind of like my fishing. I've been fishing as a kid. I like fishing. I've done a lot of boating as a kid, not catching so much. You know what it is? It's, it feels like that. And so we get to this boat. It's kind of cold out. It's kind of rainy out. And I'm like, okay, we're getting on the top of it. It's a big boat, three, three stories. So we get on the top of this. I'm like, we'll have a good boat ride. I like, it's so beautiful on the islands and we'll just have this great boat ride. And then I find out it's, it's pretty cold once that boat gets going you're on top like let's go find the bottom deck so we get into the bottom deck and good goodness gracious there is um nachos and hot dogs and beer cheese pretzels like this is the best whale watching trip ever you know so i'm lined up i'm like let's get some food this is going to be great four hours and as i'm in the line the lady gets on the mic she's like attention attention if you're in the nacho cheese line she never said this if you're getting a, a pretzel if you're getting a hot dog this is not the time to get it get out of the line and get outside we're having an encounter I'm like, we're having an encounter, like hallelujah, like I've been praying for this. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. And she, what she meant is there's killer whales. And so not just a couple, 19 killer whales. This lady, and then she's like, uh, the sawtooth is here. I'm probably getting the names wrong. I mean, what? Chainsaws there. And she knew names. And she knows, oh, grandma's here too. Oh, the brothers have shown up. Oh, the nieces and nephews are here. Oh, there's kids playing. I mean, she knew though. She pulled up a family tree on the screen. I mean, this lady for six years had been studying killer whales. I mean, all I knew was Free Willy. Like, you know, she knew them all. 
And, 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 and it's like, they're playing. And, and so she goes, hey, we're going to position a boat. We'll be in this encounter for an hour. We are not moving. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. This doesn't happen. And then all of a sudden, as we're doing this, a humpback shows up. So we have the humpback whales. We have the killer whales. And then all of a sudden, the humpback, they're like, okay, there it is. And now it just went under. And in four minutes and 32 seconds, it'll probably resurface. Because somebody timed it that it'll come up again. And I'm like, how do they know this? Sure enough, I, ch I checked it. Four minutes and about 30 seconds, it came up again. On the left side of the boat, you'll probably see it. And it comes up, and we see this, this you know, all these animals. And she goes, this is not normal. And here's what I discovered is, like, she knew all about these killer whales. She knew their habitat. She knew their, what they did. She knew the marks on their, on their tail. I could tell which one was which. And it was pretty amazing, and it made me think about uh, an encountering with the Lord. And there's something about knowledge, you know, um, that knowledge takes on a whole new meaning when you actually encounter knowledge. And, and knowledge can come into our mind, it can change our mind, but, but an encounter with the Lord, revelation, will transform our lives. And there's something when you really encounter, I could read textbooks about killer whales, but when you see them, you're like, that's pretty cool. That's cool. And I, and I feel like, you know, we can know all about God. We can know the things of God. We can go to church all our lives. We could sit in a pew, every, in a chair, a nice padded chair, every Sunday, and yet not know him. Not have an encounter. We can read all the books, and we can listen to all the podcasts, and we can watch all the YouTube videos on how to meet God, and yet not know him. And I just sense tonight, there's, there's something about encountering him. You know, A.W. Tozer said this, a right understanding in the Bible opens up us to the only path into the presence of God. Or can I say an encounter with God? And, you know, knowing isn't just knowledge. Theology is all great, but if all we have is theology and it doesn't come from out of encounter, we've missed him. And I just, I just sense he wants us to encounter him tonight. When you come to Jesus, you ask him to come into your heart, salvation, that there's this moment where you let go of your intellectual capacity and understanding. I'm a super analytical mind, so for me that was really hard, because I like my spreadsheets and I like God to fit into A1 to C6, and he fit, doesn't fit into that, he fits beyond that. He's bigger than that. And I think we realize, you see, your mind can't understand, so you have to let go and, and let God go. You have to surrender to let him in your heart. That's why it's really hard to argue someone to faith. Apologetics is great. It's a great discipleship, but it's, it's really hard to argue unless your heart's ready to make a decision. It's, you can't, with your mind, understand God. There's a point where you go, I don't, I don't understand it totally, but I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to surrender and let you in. And I believe it's the same with the Holy Spirit. We, we can't figure it all out. We can't figure Holy Spirit out. We don't, we don't know how the wind blows and where it's going to blow and what's going to happen. And we can go, oh, we want you like this. We want, and, and it just takes a moment to go, God, we just, we just want whatever you have. It's like turn off the security system. Put the watchdogs away. You know, take the, all the padlocks off the doors and be like, God, I just want you. It doesn't matter how, you, but you, you have freedom. And you know what? That takes time. For some, that might be an instant thing. For others, there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of wounds. There's a lot of things that actually have happened. And you're like, I'm, I don't know if I can go there. I don't know if I can allow God into that area of my heart. And so this is the heart of the weekend. And um, God wants to meet us afresh. And as I prayed for us as a church, I believe, can I declare that God wants to do something really fresh, that even tomorrow morning as you come, would you come with a fresh expectancy, a fresh hunger? I, my prayer is that there would be joy, joy in this place. And, and we just heard incredible people lead us in worship. They're going to be here tomorrow morning, right? Yeah, here tomorrow. You're not going home. You're not leaving? Okay, good. Um, and can, can we come in here with an expectant heart for what God's going to do? You know, we've all read the story of, of Moses in Exodus 3. Everyone know that story of Moses of Exodus 3 in the burning bush? Here's, here's what I find super fascinating about that story. Um, you know, I always go, God, give me a burning bush like that. Like, give me a burning. And some days it's pretty hot here. I feel like the bush will burn, you know. And you're like, like God, give me that burning bush. But sometimes we miss the fact that it was Moses' choice to go. And he said this, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why does a bush burn up? It was Moses' choice to go see the burning bush. I wonder how many times we've walked by impossible encounters and we haven't turned to see, oh, that's a bush that we can see.
We've been too busy. We've been too preoccupied. And, and you know what? The smart people say this. They say that um, in Hebrew it says to perceive. The Greek version would be revelation. And many rabbis say that on this passage pointing to the fact that the bush had already been on fire before Moses recognized it. It wasn't that he saw with his eyes something new that God was doing. He saw what he perceived. He saw a revelation of what God had already been doing all along. It makes me wonder how many times in our daily life God's doing something we haven't seen it. Uh, Richard Neubauer says the greatest Christian revolutions come not by the discovery of something that was known before. They happen when somebody takes radically to something that was already there. So, you know, we need an undeniable encounter with the Lord. If you have your Bibles, um, Acts chapter 12, and I'm just going to paraphrase for time tonight. I'm going to tell two stories tonight. But in Acts chapter 12, we have this story, and I've, I've read Acts a lot. This last season, this story has really stood out to me. It stood out to me because I got a book by a guy named C.S. Price. C.S. Price had actually come through this area, I believe. He ended up in Edmonton in 1923, but he was from Oxford. He ended up um, throughout kind of California, this area. He he came to Canada in the 1920s. In 1923, he was in my city, and 12,000 a night gathered, and people broke a window, put the money for the window just to get a seat in our biggest stadium for about six months straight. Why? Because they were hungry for the presence of God. And, and, and this was C.S. Price. Well, a guy that I met in, in Korea when we were there last year sent me his a newsletter, his ministry newsletter, not an email one. It was this old little book. And on it, it says, while Peter slept. I'm thinking, why? when did Peter sleep? I like to sleep, you know. When did he sleep? I don't remember that in the Bible. When did he, like it just, I just kind of passed by. And so Acts 12 is when Peter slept. And we have a story where Peter gets arrested. And, and this is, you have, at one story, you have Peter getting thrown into jail. And on the other part of this story, you have split screen going on. It's the first split screen ever, before Sony, before each um, Sharp and Toshiba and every other TV, you have a split screen happening in the Bible here. You, you have one group of people that are praying, and they're praying in this room, and they're knocking on heaven's door going, God, get Peter out of jail. We don't know what's going on. We have Peter thrown in prison, and he's thrown in prison, and it's, he's going to be executed, and they're going to they're gonna probably execute him the next day by Herod. So he's, he's in prison, and yet you have these other people, they're praying for Peter to get out of prison. One group can't see what the other group's doing. The people praying don't know what's happening with Peter, and Peter doesn't know the people praying what's going on. And you know what? See, sometimes you can't see what's happening in the other room when you're praying. We don't know what God's doing in the other room. We don't know what's happening over there. And this is what's happening in the story. It's, he's in a jail, maximum security. It's four squads of four soldiers. And it's the night before his trial, and the Bible says that Peter was sleeping between the two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. It's the night before his execution. He's in jail, and he's sleeping between two people. Do you find this weird? Like he's sleeping between the Hulk and the Rock, like two massive people. Like these are big dudes. Like do you think he says, hey, can you tuck me in before I go to bed? Uh, I forgot my blankie. You know, I I don't know. I don't know what he said. How how do you do that? How do you sleep on the the night before you're going to die between two people that are massive and very big and with chains? And the end of the story, this is what happens. An angel comes and wakes him up. He doesn't even know he's awake. He gets up. He goes to the prayer meeting house. He walks down the street. He starts knocking on the door, but they're knocking on heaven's door. So he's like, knock, knock. They're like, who's there? He's like, Peter. No, it can't be because we're praying for you. And they don't even let him in. And so then he knocks again, and they're like, no, no, it can't be you, Peter, because we're praying that you get out of jail. He goes, I'm here. I'm at the door. And so he gets in and they like, realize what God did. And God, through that whole experience, actually moved the church forward in a huge way. Because then Herod dies the next day and, and the church just grew. And it was an incredible thing what God did. But, but I, I look back at this because it's profound. It's profound that Peter gets out of jail. But I think the greater miracle in this story is that Peter can sleep the night before his trial in jail. And I can't get this out of my mind. How, how do you sleep? 
And, and I think, you know, I could preach a story about trusting God, and I could say, we need to trust God. The people praying were trusting God. Peter was trusting God. We're all trusting God. I, I could talk to you about sweet sleep. The scripture said we need sweet, sweet sleep, so if people need sleep, I, I could preach that. We all need sleep. I, I could talk different things, but the thing I want to talk to you tonight is about the trajectory of Peter's leadership. Because I think we're, we're all leaders. I believe every one of us are called to be leaders. There's a leader in every chair. You might, you might not be in leadership of the church, but you're a leader. God's called you to lead, not just to um, be someone's a consumer or sit there. God's called us each to lead, wherever we're leading. And see, we've got to look back on the journey of Peter. Who is Peter? Peter's a fisherman. He's called by God. He drops all his nets. He leaves to follow Jesus. And we see, if we look at Peter, and if you've watched The Chosen, and watch The Chosen at all, you see impulsive Peter, don't you? You see a Peter that's pretty impulsive. He's pretty, he says what he thinks. He invites people to his house even when his mother-in-law is sick. He's the first to jump in the water and walk it. He's the first on the mountain of transfiguration to say, hey, let's build tents here. No, no, Peter, we're not staying, we're going. Like that's the mission of God. We're not just staying here. He's bold, he's impulsive, he's all in. He cuts the ear uh, first of the, of the guard and Jesus goes, no, no, that's, that's not what we're doing, you know. Jesus explains to the disciples, you can't follow Follow me where I'm going. I'm going to the cross. Peter boasted, Jesus, I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus like, is like, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And what happens? We know the story. When Jesus is arrested, Peter follows the cohort into the temple area. And what happens before the rooster crows? They, he, he says, no, I don't know him. He curses. He denies him. He's just, he, he can't vocalize any support for his teacher, his master. There's such fear in him. Peter denies him. Can I say that this looks to me, and if I were to call a spade a spade, he looks like a failure in leadership. It's a failure in discipleship. Here's someone that Jesus poured his life into. Been every day, like he, he knew Jesus' B.O. Like he knew what Je like I mean, he was around Jesus. Like everything Jesus poured into him, and it's like, I just go, that's a failure of discipleship. That's a failure of leadership. But here then we see this, Jesus goes to the cross. He gets resurrection, we see the resurrection restored for each of us. So Peter can be restored, so I can be restored, so you can be restored. So the sin that causes us to die can be paid for. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And see, we live in a culture, Pastor Dan said this so beautifully a few weeks ago, I think at Easter, he said, we live in a culture where we don't restore. We cancel, we write off, and Jesus came to restore. That's the story of Jesus. He came to restore. And we see Jesus goes and sees Peter. Where was Peter fishing? See, sometimes... Um, we return back, when we, when we have shame and stuff happens in our heart, sometimes we return back to where we were when we weren't with Jesus. Sometimes shame and, and, and life bounces make us return back to the thing that we actually got freedom from before. And, and Jesus finds him fishing, finds him back to where he was, back to the beginning. And, and, and Peter jumps out of the boat, probably he throws his coat off. I'm, I'm guessing it's like a coat of shame, of feeling the shame of denying him three times. He runs and he affirms his love for Jesus. And, and three times, the same number of times he denied him, Jesus said, Peter, follow me. And Jesus said, Peter, you're the rock that I'm going to build the church on. And Jesus says, I need, you, I need to go, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2, we see this beautiful story where Peter waits with 120 people. And they're in an upper room. And in Acts 2, the, the Spirit, the presence of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes and descends on 120. But even more than this, a sound comes out of that place. 3,000 people show up. Who gets up to preach? Peter. He doesn't know what to say. He doesn't have a PowerPoint, doesn't have anything, didn't get his canvas slides ready. He has no idea what to speak. He just said, this is what's going on in Joel. This is that. And it cut straight to their hearts. And 3,000 people said, what must we do to be saved? This is the Peter we're talking about. And, when they, and then he goes on, and, and, and he goes on, and, and there's a guy at the temple, and he gets healed, and, and, and then the religious criticize it, and they call a big meeting, and they said, what's going on? And I love this. 
He says, when they saw the, pe- the courage of Peter and John and realized they were ordinary men, they were astonished and took note these men were with Jesus. But since they could see the man standing there with them, the man that got healed, there was nothing they could say. And now we get to Acts 12, and Peter's about to die. He's in jail. Do you imagine the weight on Peter right now? He's going, listen, I, 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 I'm the rock. Jesus left me as a rock, and yet maybe I failed. Maybe I didn't lead the church properly. Maybe I didn't put the right leaders in place. Maybe I, maybe I didn't have the right people. Why did I do this? Why did, maybe I shouldn't have made this move to get to jail because the church isn't ready. It's not going to survive if I'm out, if the leader's gone. And yet somehow, with all those worries and all those thoughts and all that anxiety, all that stuff, stress, he could just turn over, say goodnight to the guards and have a sleep. The night before he's going to die. Where did this ability come from? To sleep. To actually sleep. When did insecure, compulsive Peter become this guy that can just sleep and not be freaking out and want to go, hey boys, let's rumble and have like WWE, you know, UFC against the Rock and the Hulk and just take them on, right? Like take the chains and like, like that's the Peter I think it would be. Because that's who he is. He's impulsive. He's, but something changed in him. And, and, and um, so many times I think we think an encounter with God means going up somewhere. But can I suggest the encounter with God is going deep within our hearts? God wants to heal our hearts. And I believe that something happened in his heart that was healed so that he could be a Peter that slept. He got a, a baptism with the Holy Spirit also. There was an encounter with God and there was an encounter in his heart. Something happened in that upper room that changed him. Something happened that changed the trajectory of his life. You know, Ephesians 3, 16 to 20 says, I pray that out of glorious riches, he may strengthen you with a power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. What's God's will for us? To strengthen every one of us in our innermost being. That we would be strong in our innermost being. Nehemiah went to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem when the enemy was kept coming in and coming in. See, the walls protected the temple. The, our lives are now the temple. The Holy Spirit wants to heal the wounds, wants to heal the attacks on the enemy. Wants to, wants to heal our hearts where the enemy has attacked it. To rebuild the wall. That's, that's God's will, restoration of our hearts. See, Jesus didn't just come to save us from sin and give us a bunch of knowledge. He came so that he would heal our hearts. By his stripes, your heart and my heart could be made well. And I believe he wants to heal our hearts. See, the Jesus I encounter will be the Jesus I lead others to. If I encounter him, the Holy Spirit I encounter will be the Holy Spirit that I lead others to as well. Peter had an encounter And it's in the presence of Jesus that we are changed, that we look like the image of God, that we are transformed, 2 Corinthians 3 says, into his image. A.W. Tozer said, it's a fear of falling into the hands of God that makes us so eager to get things reduced to a formula. We feel that if we can learn the secret of salvation or the steps in the blessed life, we can control our future. And though we would not admit it, control God himself to a large degree. This saves face and preserves our self-confidence, but it mutes the voice of the power in the gospel and weakens the operations of God in the soul. Some of us have a story of letdown, denial, rejection, hurt. And if you don't, and you've been around the church, I don't believe you. I've been in churches, and the church I grew up had a big split. Thousands of people left. There, there, was, there was board that took the church to court. There was people that were disgruntled. I mean, messy stuff, hard stuff. There's times that I've been left out. I felt like nobody saw me. I feel like I wasn't picked for something. Or, or my dad ushered at the same church for 50 years and wasn't recognized for that. You know, things like that. If you've been around church... There, there are wounds because why? There's people and people have wounds and people have things and people do things at times that hurt. Or, you know, at times maybe you've been around things and, and cynicism can grow. See, there's church hurt and it's the atmosphere where cynicism grows. Cynicism is this feeling I haven't seen or I haven't tasted, so how can I believe? 
What cynicism is, is actually just self-protection. I don't want to be hurt. Protect us so we don't get hurt again. I don't want to go there again. I grew up in a church where um, there was things that I saw in the moving of the Holy Spirit that, that could offend, that could hurt, you know. Um, I remember one time I was at this, uh, I was 14, and my parents went on a family trip, and we flew to uh, Toronto, and then we were going to uh, Orlando for Disney World. And so we took one of my friends with me, and I'm 14 years old, and we go to this church. This church was having a revival. So my parents took, and I mean, I was like, there was people like spinning around with big flags. The wheel of God is turning around us. And I'm like, this is weird. This is really weird. And then at the end of it, they preach. It was super like four hours long. And then at the end, they had a big warehouse. And they had duct tape. And they had lines. And they had lines on the ground. And they lined people up. And I remember, I remember being there on the lines. And I'm like, okay, I just want prayer. And so they prayed. And as they would pray, people were falling all over the place. And I'm like, okay, I just want prayer. I don't know if I want to fall. Um, I just want prayer. I'm 14. I'm just like, and, I, and they got to me. And here's what happened. I'm sitting there, I'm just like, God, I want you. Well, they start praying, and as they start pushing, I mean, I was like, my neck is going to break, my neck is going to break, my neck is going to break. And I just courtesy dropped, because I didn't want to have neck pains for the rest of my life. I'm like, I'm just going to drop. But I laid on that floor, and I had a decision to make in my heart. Am I going to be offended that maybe something out of flesh pushed me over, and it wasn't God, it was man? Yeah, I, I could be. But I don't know, I stood back up and I said, God, I want you more. I don't care if it's man or whatever. I want you, God. Something marked me that night where I said, I'm hungry for more. It doesn't matter. Yes, man does things. And yes, that person shoved me. But listen, I'm not going to let someone shoving me hold me back from what God has for me. And there's sometimes cynicism grows or or experiences we have. It's like, I don't know about that. Listen, yeah, we don't know about it. But all I know is I want God. And sometimes we can let hurts hold us back from an encounter of more. And it's time that God wants to heal our heart. He wants to set us free from cynicism and those thoughts. And he wants to come in and say, hey, are you hungry for me? And I can't shake it. I I just feel a weight in this room tonight that, that the Holy Spirit is the intercessor, the comforter. And he's here to heal, to restore, to set us free from all those wounds. Those church wounds, those life wounds, those, those whatever wounds where we blame God. Jesus knows your story and he knows mine. And like Peter, he meets him and he says, feed my sheep. Nothing catches Jesus off guard. He's here to restore us, to resurrect us. See, if, if, we, if we hold on to our hurts, then what we say is encounter isn't enough. Jesus isn't enough. Our hurts are bigger than God. But that's not true. Jesus died on the cross for our hurts, for our wounds, for our cynicism, for all of that. The presence. I want to to close with this last story. and um, It's an obscure story in Scripture. Has anyone heard of the story of Obed-Edom before? Maybe you've not heard. Yeah, a few people from Salem. They talk about Obed-Edom in Salem. (laughs) But Obed-Edom is, King David is trying to move the, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel, he got 30,000 troops to bring the ark of God, the box of God. This is in the Old Testament where God lived. Like, this is his box. This is like they had ceremonial things. It's like a big box with wings on it. Like, this is the box of God. And so they bring this box of God. They get 30,000 troops. And David is a king. The first thing he does when he's king, he says, let's get the ark of God brought back to the temple, to Jerusalem. My first act as king is to get the ark of God. See, the ark was, had been, um, for 70 years, had been outside the tabernacle. It had not been there. David experienced God in the field and in the caves, and something new, the first order of business for him was get the ark of God into the temple. I'm not leading a nation unless the ark of God is in the temple. I'm not going forward. You know, what God does in you, he wants to do through you. And so what God did through David in, 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 in the field, he's like, oh, I want, I want to bring that into the city. I want to bring the presence into the city. I, I want that. Saul was king for 40 years, and he never did this. Can you imagine doing, sacrificing bulls and sheep and all the things that he did, 
And he never brought the presence of God into the temple, he, tabernacle. He never brought the presence of God. He, he, did the, he, did the, he did the religious things. He was sacrificing the bulls and the sheep. And yet there was no presence. Church can be that if we don't have an encounter with Jesus, with who, what it's all about. We can go through life coming Sunday after Sunday. Oh, yeah, got to be here at 1030. Check in, do our time, and go back on with the week without the presence of God. And David's like, I need the presence of God. And so he wants restoration of the presence. And where the presence of God went, this box of God actually was carted around. At one time, the Philistines took it on a cart, and, and, and they went before their god, Dagon. And it's a crazy story if you haven't read it. And then Dagon, he ends up like falling down and bowing. The statue ends up falling and bowing to this box of God. And then the next day, they come, and Dagon's head's cut off. And he's like still bowing down. Like It is, it is remarkable. The, the Philistines are like, we don't want it. Then the other people get it, and there's plagues and tumors. We don't want the box of God. Get it out of here. And for 70 years, you know, and then all of a sudden 70 men decide to like, it's a good idea to go look inside the box of God. Not a good idea. They all die. So everybody's terrified of the box of God. Like we don't want this thing. Take it away. No one wants it. And then they put it on an ox cart. David goes, okay, let's get 30,000 troops, put it on an ox cart. And what happens, it wasn't done right. It wasn't the way it was supposed to be carried. And Uzzah, which actually his name means strength, what happens is, is the ark of God is coming and it hits a pothole with the ox cart and it's about to fall and smash. And so Uzzah, with his own strength, grabs it and goes, hey, I'm going to stop it. With my own strength, I'm going to stop the, 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 the ark of God from falling. See, he touches the holy. And holiness or an encounter with God is not our own strength. It's, it's by God. I can't become holy. I become holy with an encounter with God. And, and not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit. So you can't steady God. He steadies us. And he tried to steady the presence of God. He couldn't do that. What happened? He was struck dead instantly. So now we have a major issue. Occupational work and safety is there. I mean, the whole scene is shut down. And they can't move forward. And David goes, halt. We need to move the box of God somewhere while we figure out what to do. This guy dies. Everything's a mess. So they move the box of God to some guy's house. They're like, Obed Edom, will you serve the? Will you have the box of God? Do you imagine having the box of God moving it? Dan Jean, would you like the box of God in your house? Like, which room are you gonna put it in? Like, stick it there and then tell your kids, hey, like the angel box, like stay away from it because you'll die. Like, you imagine sticking in the backyard? It's like the kids would love it because you play Frisbee and your Frisbee would just go, like, for ultimate, it'd be just, the Frisbee would just, like, launch over it. It's like, put the box of God in the middle and play Frisbee over it, you know? I don't know what they did with this box of God. But the Bible says for three months it was at his house. And he was blessed. Uh, he, he was blessed. There was increase. He was blessed so much that David got jealous. He's like, I want the box of God back to Jerusalem. That's where it's supposed to be. And, and you imagine, so this box of God ends up coming and, and, and David does it the right way. He carries it on people and they do this sacrifice and they bring it. David moves the ark, you know, he's dancing in his tidy whities or his gaunchers, whatever, on the streets. I mean, he is dancing and celebrating and it's this crazy moment where he, he puts away his, priest, his kingly outfit and puts on his priestly and just celebrates the, the presence of God. We don't hear about Obed-Edom for a while, and then he surfaces again in the Bible in Jerusalem. Where is he? Where the ark is. He moved his whole family, and now he's in Jerusalem where the ark is. He's first as a temple porter, and then a singer with the instruments, and then he's a treasurer in the temple. See, why would a successful businessman leave and do those humble jobs? He became in love with the presence of God. The presence of God was in his house, and he goes, I can't, I can't live without the presence of God. I'm following it to Jerusalem. I'm taking my whole family there. He couldn't do anything else again. And there's something that when you have an encounter with God, you can't go back. You can't put it back in the box and say, oh, okay, I forgot about that encounter. When God changes you, it's hard, to, it's hard to go back to the way life was before. And so, what the cool thing about Obed-Edom is, He's actually a Philistine. His family was from Gath. He's a Gittite, which actually means he's a Philistine. 
And yet the Bible says at the end of the story, we see that when they talk about him in the generations that come after, there's worshipers and there's, there's temple workers and they're all from his line, Obed-Edom. His grandchildren are all connected to this. And see, the presence of God actually transformed his identity and he's actually listed as a Levite later in scripture. See, he, his whole identity shifted. Why? Because he was around the presence of God. Whatever's in our identity, whatever's in our past, whatever the stuff we carry, whatever in our heart, it can be changed in a moment in his presence. See, it's an encounter that changes our identity. It's an encounter that shifts things. See, there's a lifestyle that comes from the encounter. Encounter breaks the fear of man. Every generation needs an encounter. Moses had an encounter. It changed the trajectory of his life. Peter had an encounter that brought restoration. David had an encounter. I want to ask, can I ask the, uh, you guys to come play? Yeah. Or whoever, uh, maybe a guitar and, and a keyboard. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Thanks, guys. See, unless we have a fresh encounter, encounter can become religion. Every generation needs their own encounter. And I think sometimes, can we become too familiar with a God we don't know? Can we be too, what happened with the Ark of the Covenant, they became too familiar with a God, didn't know. They, 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 they thought, oh, we could just put God on a, on a cart. God was never, his presence was never made for structure and systems. His presence is made for people, for us, for our hearts, that the presence of God would touch us, would heal us. And so, there's, you know, Pastor Greg Crochelle talks about three generations of leadership. He said the first generation have an encounter. They're pioneers. They build churches. Maybe it's the people that built Yakima Alliance or the Alliance Yakima. It's the first generation. They're a builder. They're a pioneer spirit. And then the second generation that come after them, they try to uphold what the first created. They try to not squander. They try to manage and steward it well. But then there's a third and fourth generation come and they've never pioneered. They've never built it. And, and, and they are entitled to it. They're entitled to what always were because they were never there when it was new and fresh. They were never there. And, and, and you know, generation two upholds generation one and generation three, four are born into it. They don't have that pioneer mindset. And I think that's what we're seeing in the Plateauan churches in, our, in America and in Canada. It's the same thing. Where, where churches can come to a point where there's a plateau of the people that founded it are no longer there. And we're trying to go, okay, this was found in this church. And then you see a church plant come along. And there's just fire in a church plant. Why? Because it's a first generation. And I think every one of us as leaders, every one of us as people of God, need to always get back to that first generation mindset. To go, it's time to pioneer. It's time to believe. It's time to lead. It's not time to just uh, manage what someone else built. But how do we? How do we get back to that? See, my great, 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 my great, no, my, not great, my grandfather, and my grandma had an encounter with God. They came from uh, Poland. They did not know God. They came to Alberta. I shared this story on a Sunday here, and and my grandma was dying at 40 years old. She heard of an evangelist at a church. She went to that. My grandfather went to the church. She couldn't go. She couldn't get out of bed. My grandfather got prayer. When she got home, my grandmother was completely healed, sitting up, brushing her daughter's hair, completely healed. She lived another 57 years till she was 97. Why? Because God touched her. That's how my dad became a Christian. That's how, I, and I can trace it. But if I rely on my dad's, my great my grandfather's encounter then you know what it is it's like i'm relying on that i'm relying on that encounter but then it just becomes rules oh we go to church because that's what we do we, we do the things that god's we're supposed to do why because my grandfather had an encounter every generation needs their own encounter we each need a fresh encounter because holiness isn't something that we do uh, holiness finds us god finds us when we encounter God, when Moses encountered God, he, he then said, oh, I gotta live different. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrecked. Stuff changes when we encounter God. So if we try to clean ourselves up and do all these rules and, you know what, they get tiring after a while. But if we do them out of a fear of God, if we do it because we've encountered God, everything changes. I don't wanna do things that, I, that, would, that would hurt my relationship with God because I've had an encounter and it's changed everything. 
And so I want to say tonight, every one of us need a fresh encounter. If you haven't heard God's voice for yourself, if, if you just went to church and just did church, God wants to encounter you fresh. If there's hurt in your heart, He wants to touch you. Why did Uzzah put his hand on the ark? Was there an entitlement? Maybe he was too familiar with the presence, yet not encountering the presence. Holiness isn't cleaning up on our own strength or like Uzzah's strength. It's deep surrender to God. It's an encounter with Him. What generation are we? How do we break cynicism? As I prayed for us tonight, how do we break the cynical spirit? Keep coming back to hunger. It's hunger. When I was about 19 years old, I was at a camp. Kind of a building similar to this. I was doing sound at the back. Power of God start moving up here. And I remember I moved to the front row right there and I just said, I want to watch God what you're doing the rest of my days. I had no desire to speak. I had no desire to do this. I just want to see the power of God move in people. And I believe that's what he wants to do in each one of us tonight. Wherever you're at tonight, there, there's, a, there's a God that wants to move. And, and wherever you, he's moved before, there's more. There's more. There's more of God for each one of us tonight. So I'm going to invite I'm going to invite the worship team guys if you would all come and uh, God's been showing me as I've prayed for us that worship is a key. See, worship shifts the atmosphere. It's in the atmosphere of worship that miracles happen. It's in the atmosphere of see when you walk in when you walk in this place. My, my prayer is that the prayer room would be electric, that there would be prayer that rises here. That, that tomorrow morning as you walk in, there would be an electricity of the presence of God. There would be an expectation that God's going to meet us. That we would turn and go, hey God, what do you have for us today? And that starts in worship. That starts to go, God, I'm going to worship. Wherever you're at in worship, what would it look like to move to another level of worship to God? Worship is sacrifice. If we look in the Old Testament, worship is, they sacrifice bulls. They, it's cost something. It wasn't just to sing some songs and look at the screen. It was, it was worship with abandonment. It doesn't matter if you know the song, you never heard the song. It, it's a heart thing to go, God, I'm going to worship you. These guys have led us tonight, and I feel there's a level. We're going to go back in a moment, and we're just going to worship. And I want you to worship like you've never worshiped before. To move your needle on worship. Maybe worship, you're like, okay, I kind of worship. What would it look like with abandonment was to go, God, I'm going to worship in a whole new way. I'm going to give you everything you deserve because you saved my life. I'm here because of you. I am saved because of you. You are great and worthy to be praised. You're in this place. You do the impossible. You're the God who sees me. You're the God who knows me. You're the God that encounters me. And I'm going to worship. Every fiber in my being is going to sing your praise. I'm going to dance if I need to. I'm going to lay on the floor if I need to. I'm going to whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like a joy that changes things. Like you just go, ah, God, I just I want to worship you. Again, it's not just all about you know, put our hands up. I've been in places where everyone puts their hands up, and in their heart, they're not there. So it's not, it's not just an outward thing. But sometimes an outward thing is a, a response. Sometimes we don't feel like it. It's not about feelings. It's about who God is. God has never changed. He's still worthy to be praised. Whether you feel like it or you don't feel like it. Whether you had the worst sleep in ever, it doesn't really matter. God is still worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. And hunger, you know, hunger is innate. The hunger after God is innate. A newborn baby, it doesn't matter who's in the room, what the issue is. If they're hungry, they'll cry. That's it. Hunger isn't a thing that they, they're just innate. It's who they are. They just hunger. And I believe God wants to say, hey, hunger in us for, hung, for him is innate. He, we're created in the image of God. It's time to whatever is suppressing that hunger, whatever is filling that hunger with other things, it's time to expose it, heal it, and say, God, I'm hungry for you tonight. So can we stand up across this place? And in a moment, we're going to do something to pray. And I just believe an opportunity that for prayer for people tonight, that God wants to touch people. But I just, I want you guys, if you just lead us. And we're just going to just lead us. And would we worship in a whole new place tonight?